our amazing moderator for the panel, Tatiana McFadden. Let's give it up. Hello, everyone. I just want to say thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you, LA. Thank you, Real Abilities. This is such a great time to celebrate people with disabilities and the stories that we have to tell. And uh, we're just really looking forward to the conversation. So thank you very much. Um, before we start, I just want to introduce our, our panelists first. So we'll start with Greg, and then we'll work our way down. Uh, Greg from How Do You Think? Hey, hey, LA, how's everybody doing? I'm Leroy Moore. I'm a paraplegic um, athlete from the 1988, and also um, one of the founders of Crip Hot Nation. And we did the theme song for um, Rising Phoenix. Emmy Award winning. And hopefully Grammy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, I'm Ashley Dos Santos. I am on the communications team for the LA 28 Olympic and Paralympic Games, um, coming back to LA in less than six short years. Hello everyone, I'm Matt Wiener, a longtime sports agent and um, a longtime LA resident as well. Um, I've done a lot of work in the Olympic and Paralympic space with national governing bodies here in the United States and then also some more international rights holders, and uh, very excited and honored to be on this panel. I think we'll start by asking, with the games coming to Los Angeles, we know that there will be increased visibility and increased momentum surrounding the Paralympic movement. I'm already, as an athlete, I'm already seeing incremental changes, but I want to ask the panelists, what changes do you think we will see, and particularly changes in Hollywood? So, Ashley, we'll start with you on this one. Yes, absolutely. Although I feel like the Hollywood question should go to Greg and Leroy, but we'll have you guys go next. Um, so for the Paralympic Games, I think we're going to see an increase in awareness and excitement for the Games, as we should. I mean, I think everyone here can agree that it's long overdue. Um, for us at LE28, of course, we want to create an amazing Paralympic and Olympic experience for athletes and fans. But we're really invested in the human legacy, which comes with disability inclusion and awareness, but really investing in the future of sports for kids, especially of all abilities. So we have invested in partnership with the IOC, $160 million, to fund youth sport through the city of LA between when we first won the bid um, in 2017 through to 2028, so that the pre-legacy is really already alive and well, well before the games even come to LA. And a huge component of that, and you know, part of the, the grant stipulations that we had was that there is an increase, or at least a creation, and then an increase of para sport for kids throughout LA, because previously that did not exist prior to our program. Um, there was, of course, a delay, as we all had with COVID, but we can say very proudly that this academic year, we are offering a wide variety of para-sport for kids from ages 2 to 18 throughout LA, and that's that human legacy and that pre-legacy that we're especially proud of to create, and I think that's going to be a big part of the theme for the LA 28 Paralympics. Wonderful, and the, the Hollywood question, Greg, do we want to start with you? I, I, I mean, I think the world looks at America and, and sees leadership or wants leadership. And the world looks at California and thinks that's, if you like, where so much of what we think is created. So the, the biggest opportunity that you have here in L.A. is a shift in culture and ultimately a shift in the way that we perceive, I think, um, around disabilities. That's what the Paralympic gives you this human legacy that it's really like nothing else you'll ever work on or be part of i guess the the the, the thing for for me as an outsider would be i mean like hollywood and the storytelling machine here is just unbelievable and the that that opportunity for you know your city your your state your country to use the power of the paralympics to kind of shift minds i mean actually if you think about it quite rationally think of all the ceos that will um that, whose brands will back the games and think of every one of them changing 
um, the procedures and their workplace so more people with disability are employed. Honestly, seriously, like when you get into that and you add many multiples to it, the cultural opportunity you have is remarkable and, um, and probably the greatest in history, to be fair. I agree, and I'm really excited that the games will be here in LA because I feel like the US needs a game like that, like a games like this. And Leroy, do you think you, we hear the music? Oh yeah, the music <laughs> is number one. And, and you know, being with Queer Pot Nation, you know, um, we want the Paralympics, you know, to really dig deep in the community, like Queer Pot is doing. Uh, we are in Inglewood building a Queer Pot Institute. So after the Olympics, you know, people, youth, can come to the Queer Pot Institute and see themselves. The, the, the planet has come around every four years, but we know that disabled youth and disabled adults need to see themselves every day. So Queer Pot is not waiting for Hollywood. Queer Pot is not waiting for anybody else. We're doing it today. And we need the Paralympics, the Olympics in LA to really invest in community, in community answers, in community activism. Because that's going to stay here long after the Paralympics is gone. So we need to really invest in community, and that's what Kripot is doing. So I invite everybody, you know, the Paralympics, the Olympics, to come to Inglewood and see what we're doing every day beyond the Olympics and during the Olympics and after the Olympics and before the Olympics. And Matt, as a, a sports agent's background, um, what changes do you see you know, for, for Paralympic athletes and for people with disabilities in this community? You know, um, to me, it's, as, an, as an outsider looking in, I think it's... Um, it's pretty clear and it's pretty short, which is simply, and you see this with the brilliance of Greg's storytelling, it's very hard to find truly authentic stories. And I think for Hollywood, as you th think about Los Angeles and leaving a legacy for these games, you have truly authentic stories and people behind those stories who wanna tell them. And that's very powerful, very real, and I think all of those stories need a big megaphone, and I think Hollywood has a, a tremendous opportunity in the not too distant future to start telling those stories in a big way. I agree. Um, I, I'm as an athlete, I'm really excited that the games are going to be home. I think that sports, as we've seen today, and a great example is women's soccer, that sports can parallel so much and can really bring equality out. And I want to ask, all of you, what are you excited about for the LA 28 games being, being here? We can start with Ashley. <laughs> well, I'm a native Angelino, so I'm really <laughs> excited to be able to host the games in Los Angeles and show off all of the amazing things about the city that I love and I'm proud to call home. And I think beyond that, beyond telling LA's story, we are telling the story of having a US home games and we are welcoming the world to Los Angeles. And we have a responsibility to tell everyone's story. I mean, I think what Hollywood obviously does is it is an epicenter of storytelling. And that's what we want the LA 28 games to be as well. We wanna be telling athletes stories the stories of the people behind the community organizations, like Leroy pointed out, who are keeping the city going and growing and thriving. And I think that that's really unique to LA to be able to have all of the mechanisms and delivery components to be able to tell that, that beautiful holistic story over the next several years. And to Leroy's point as well, well beyond 2028. Exactly. And Leroy, what about you? What are you looking forward to for the LA 28 games? Well, I'm really looking forward to the city getting more accessible. You know, I'm really following the ADA, really following the Rehabilitation Act. You know, it's good to have diversity and inclusion, but we have laws that need to be enforced 
and it needs to be um, fully funded. And with the Olympics comes a lot of money <laughs> to, to, to just be honest, and that money should go towards making LA more accessible and coming up to the standard of the ADA and all of our laws. Yeah, no shortcuts, right? Mm -hmm. No shortcuts, right? No, no, no shortcuts at all. I, I... Is this on? Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm just working in the business of sport for a long, long time. One thing, being a native Angelino, is um, I'm incredibly excited to be a fan and to celebrate these athletes and um, having those athletes come to Los Angeles in our backyard is going to be um, going to be, I think, very, very fun. And um, I think on the as it relates to the commercial opportunity, or as you think about the big corporations that are based in California, um, being able to utilize this to start building a movement and figuring out that it's not just a um, sort of a traditional uh, brand corporate engagement. It's part of a much bigger, deeper movement. And again, you're seeing this with the likes of the stories that Greg and um, the team here is able to tell. Absolutely. And I have to give a big shout out to, to NBC because as we increase our um, hours and our time, it, people, we know that people want to see it. Um, recently, I raced in the Chicago Marathon and I got notified by the race director in Chicago, and they said, Tatiana, we have some really exciting news. Uh, Chicago Marathon is going to cover full coverage for the very first time for the wheelchair racers. And I, I was surprised, and, and I was shocked. And I said, well, why? And they said, because the public wants it. And so I am so excited to see that this is happening now, just what we can do in the next six years. And I'm so excited for all these endless possibilities and, and seeing what we can do and what makes you excited for LA. So when I was, when I was very, can you hear me? Yep. When I was very young, the LA Games 1984, they completely blew my mind. Um, because <laughs> you, you remember <laughs> the jetpack, yeah? So it, it can stunned me, you know, like I was from Nottingham in England and I'd never seen anyone fly through the sky like that. I think our expectations of, of LA will be different this time. I think it will be much more about the, the power of the game. So um, listen, in the UK, we're a small country. We're, we're having a bit of a moment at the moment, but in general, we're good at this stuff. We're progressive, we want things to change. But you guys have enormous power compared to what we had. So I'm really interested in the laws that need to change, the CEOs that can lead their companies and change them. I, I, it will come and go. The one thing I can say with authority is that thing will come and go, but the, its power to change you as a city, as a state, as a, as a country is remarkable. So actually the social power is the thing that I think is your jetpack. Yep. Just and, one oh. one thing to add. It's not just the it's not just the opportunity and the power. I think it's the responsibility as well, and that's a really tremendous opportunity. Is that we have the responsibility, and something that I think we're picking up more and more now is um, people not just what you know in the old days. Because I love the Olympics. I love the Paralympics. I mean, somebody said to me on the 2012 project. They said it's fine. The Olympics is always 11 out of 10. It's fine. Um, it depends whether it hits 17, and I was kind of like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, I think now the expectations have changed, if not so much should we be part of it, but what, how do you harness its power? I agree. And I think you make a good point about power because I'm a 20-time Paralympic medalist, right? And if I was an Olympic medalist, a 20-time Olympic medalist, I could own an island in Hawaii. <laughs> Um, but we know that the, you know, the visibility is not that just there. And competing at, competing at the Tokyo Paralympic Games was my first time in 16 years of my career that I got equal pay. So we're, we're moving. Thank you. <laughs> so we're, we're moving, but, you know, we're, uh, we're moving towards things. And so I just hope that, you know, we're, we're moving at a much, you know, quicker pace by the time, you know, L.A. happens. And... Because we know with the Paralympic Games that our key to success is, is full engagement. 
And the, the full engagement is with our sponsors and with the brands and volunteers during the games and, and even after. And so how do we, can, how can we get people engaged? And most importantly, for after the games, as you mentioned, Leroy, um, how do you think we can get people to be fully engaged? I think, I think we need to say, hey, you know, it's the law. We're not asking for anything. We're not talking about diversity and inclusion. We're talking about the law. So really, following the law and following what's happening in the community. Because we got some unsung heroes that are working 24-7 in the community around disability justice, around disability rights, and really uplifting them to, to bring them to another stage. You know, for example, um, Quip Hop is starting our own channel. Not a YouTube channel, but our own channel because we got sick of acting Hollywood. And we decided that we'll just do it. You know, so these, these are the projects that are happening right now before the Olympics. And so we need, you know, corporate sponsors and businesses to go in the community and say, okay, you guys are doing the work. Here is some resources so you can take it to the next level. And Ashley, being on the you know, board for LA 28 Games, how are you, you're working with sponsors and brands and, and volunteers in the future. How, do you, how are you going to get them fully engaged starting now, essentially? Because it's going to be in the next two sleeps, I feel like. You know, the LA is going to be here. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's critically important that we work with our partners to use their platforms, to use their megaphones, to be able to help educate and increase awareness. Because I, I wish it were as easy as saying, it's the law, we, we need to do this, we need to make sure we're compliant, we need to make sure you know there's equal pay, there's equal access. But I think we all see a lot of laws get ignored, a lot of laws get overturned when it comes to providing you know equality and access and fair treatment of everyone. And it really is education that needs to be at the crux of everything that we do because people are afraid of what they don't know or they ignore it or you know a variety of other more unfortunate things. And I think the more the people become aware, the more the people have a friend or a colleague or a neighbor or someone that they can speak to and say, we have more similarities than differences and there's also power in our differences and there's a beauty in that. I think that we will start to see real change in our corporate partners, our, you know, our sponsors are the ones who need to be on the ground floor helping us with that base level education. Yep. And Matt? Yeah, you know, I'm interested to get Greg's take in doing work all over the world with a number of different um, governing bodies, notably in the Paralympic movement, but also in the more traditional Olympic space. I think. Um, my viewpoint is it's really, really hard to be first. And what I mean by that is it's really hard to be the first one to sign up and raise your hand in a really big way and say, not only do I desire to do this, but I stand for it and I'm going to put my company, I'm going to put the brand, I'm going to put our bank account behind it. It generally is always easier to be second, uh, but I think even more so as it relates to sort of the rebalancing of power, and you're seeing this in, um, you know, general gender equity or rebalancing in global football and soccer with the women's movement starting to take hold. For example, the Euros in the summer of 2022, um, I think outdrove viewership of many men's national soccer team games around the world. And I think that caught a lot of people off guard. Um, I always use the, and it's probably pretty dated now because it was 2016 in Rio, um, the Paralympics sold more tickets to live events in Rio than the Olympics did. And I think not only that story is a really important one, but it's a it's a message that gets lost, and it gets lost because nobody's telling it. And I think we need companies to stand behind this movement and be the ones that raise their hands and be first, because it's really hard to be first, but when you are first, you start a movement. I couldn't agree more. It's always 
hard to be the first because that's, as being an advocate, you know, you always ask why. Um, you know, when you want more media coverage or, or equal pay, it is hard to, to be the first and to make, that, to make that movement. And Greg, when you founded HTYT Films, you know, you were the first. And you can understand a little bit of the fights happening. And so how, from your experience and, you know, following years, you know, how can you get more brands on board and, and trusting the, the process and, and being part of our movement? In, in our, if you've ever had anything to do with like one of these big projects, the, we call it the hockey stick problem, which is like it's a ten, eight to ten year project, and and the organising committee are working every day. And by the way, they don't go home for four years. At some point, you know, they'll just sleep in the office, and then and then no joke, it comes and it goes very quickly. And the danger with that is um, you don't really harness its full potential. And, and the conundrum has always been, how do you try and change the shape of that? And I, I actually think the answer to that ultimately is about building a collective of people that share the same vision. And ultimately, that's not always, you can't say to the organizing committee, can you make everything happen? Because the pressure for them really is on building and then um, holding the event, keeping everyone safe, creating an extraordinary games. That's where brands, I think, are coming in. And I think the brands used to be into the hockey stick, actually. They were part of the problem. But if you want to get very technical, they now understand the problem with the hockey stick is that when they activate, they are doing so at a point where their market share is so low that no one notices. So I think what's beginning, if I'm honest, in 2018, I, I literally came all the way around LA and all the way around London trying to finance our first film. And everyone just said, no way, no one will watch it. And... Um, I think 400 million people talked about it on Twitter. So yeah. we kind of proved them wrong. Um, it's much easier now to raise the money to do these things. It's much easier to talk to the brands. Um, so, and I think that's probably LA's unique moment in time because actually you've had the longest run at a Paralympic project. You've, you've had the longest period to think it through. So I commend everything that's going on and, and the enormous effort for your city to put on something amazing. But I think there's a role for real leaders now. That's the key thing. I don't think Paris have had the same opportunity. And, and I don't think this is about waiting for 2028, 20, I agree. I think this really is about a, a number of leaders stepping up now and saying that we want to build something long-term. And then when the games have gone, um, still campaigning those issues. I've noticed such a big movement um, since, you know, just 2000, I started in 2004 to 2008. Uh, to 2012 and I think you know the domino effect really started in 2016 and I have a really cute story that I have to share I was training on the track the other day I'm training for marathons I have a, the New York City Marathon in about two weeks and I was out on the track and a little boy and his father were there and he goes dad like what's that he goes oh son like that's a racing chair she uses that you know to to compete um either in track or in marathons or the paralympics and that was huge for me because i'm like oh my gosh we're we're making it and my question for you guys is that what can you do in in the next six years to ensure a strong legacy as possible for 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 the games because i feel like everyone has a part here we'll start with you greg I never forget walking out of the Olympic and Paralympic Stadium. By the way, we renamed this as a challenge if you want one. When, at London 2012, everyone used to say, I work for the Olympics. So I changed the name of the organizing committee to the London 2012 Paralympic and Olympic Committee. I, yeah. I flipped the name and it worked. Change approved. Yeah, like and because actually, you do, <laughs> otherwise people walk around LA going, I work for the Olympics. And you go, no, you don't. You work for both. So exactly. I'm not saying you should, because that, that worked no, in the No pressure. <laughs> I'll talk to the big guys. <laughs> Even culturally, it happens. Um, listen, I think it's always about leadership and, um, and visioning and people believing in the vision. So the organizing committee will have set an extraordinary, powerful vision for this thing. I think you look beautiful um, in terms of where this is heading, but it's now about delivery. And even though it's six years away, um, that means tomorrow. And... I mean, the, the biggest question is not so much, are you going to have a games? It's what ideas do you have as a city, as a group of brands? What ideas do you have that can actually create the kind of shift 
um, in, at, I think, attitudinal shift. By the way, in the UK, employment for people with disability doubled after the Paralympic Games. And those numbers have not gone down. Um, there's still a long way to go in the UK for people with disability, very sadly. But, but think about that. If you go back to the creation of the Paralympic movement, the person that created it actually wanted to help people with spinal injuries get jobs because he felt that without jobs, it was hard to have a purpose in life. So um, you've got a lot of opportunities, maybe too many as a city. I would narrow it down into in a very small number of legacy opportunities and just work really hard every day to find the leaders to help you reach them. And what about you, Ashley? Yeah, you touched on something in your previous answer, Greg, that I loved, and it was really about the spirit of co-creation. And I think that that's been at the core of who we are at LA28 since we won the bid for 24 that became 28. And we're looking to bring everyone into not just the storytelling, but in bringing the games to life and ensuring that legacy continues well on, you know, well past the games. I think accessibility through the city, utilizing the games as the catalyst for change that it can be, you know, we're, we're um, inspiring, you know, LA Department of Transportation and LA Metro and others to get their construction projects done well ahead of time um, to make sure that we are fully accessible and that we are a car free games, which is going to be fantastic. You know, making sure that folks have a good experience at the airport, which historically for LAX hasn't necessarily been the case, but it's getting better every day. Uh, we were just at the Terminal 3 opening of Delta last month, um, which is just a thing of beauty and fully accessible. Um, I think that there's just so much that we can do, to Greg's point. We do have to stay laser focused, but not everyone necessarily has to. If we're working with community partners, we're working with our sponsors, there are so many lanes that they can each take so that on a local scale and on a global scale, we're able to implement real change that is long lasting. What about you, Matt? Two things. One is we have to tell these stories and we have to broadcast these stories the way that Greg is broadcasting these stories. We need to find more Gregs out there in the world to celebrate them because they are truly at their core inspirational. Um, and if we don't tell those stories now, they'll be forgotten after the games. And I think we are fortunate in Los Angeles to have six years without real infrastructure needs for the facilities that are already built or going to be opened. We can focus on community. We can focus on bringing these athletes to the forefront, telling their stories to educate. And then I, I, I think the second thing, which is maybe more important is we need to take those stories and be able to educate them to the mass consumer and not just the people uh, who are all here attending this conference, but actually educate the general Angelino, the general California, and the general American why they should care. And I think we can do that in part by telling the stories, but we also need to collectively co-create, um, bring on the right community partners, the right corporate sponsors, the right brands, the right local entities to um, not only celebrate the story, but actually act on it. And um, I think that groundswell of pressure, uh, once that education is there, it'll become a responsibility and that change will have to be affected. It won't be an option anymore. And I think we need to get there and we're not there yet. And I think you're spot on with storytelling. I feel like that's a very common theme that we've had tonight. And I have one more good story that I had a, a previous sponsor, a VP, and I was really fortunate to be with them three years. And the first time I was, it was only two Paralympians and the rest of them were Olympic athletes. Um, then the following games, it was uh, even and even. There were three Paralympians and there were three Olympians. And I'm like, wow, this is kind of strange, like we're, we're even now. And then going up to the games in, in 2012, they chose more Paralympic athletes than they did Olympic athletes. And I, I asked the company, I was like, why, why did you choose more Paralympic athletes than Olympic athletes? And they said, we love your stories. We feel like you're so relatable to society. And, and, and it's, much more than just the inspiration, but it, it's more so like the, the attitudes. You know, I feel like we, we all go through something really hard in life, but Paralympic athletes 
proceed to do it and, and achieve their goal. And I feel like that's not the general public and they can learn a lot from Paralympic athletes, um, whether if they're newly injured um, or they had their disability from birth. And I just want to follow up with Leroy. What do you want to see the next six years? We can leave a, a legacy here in LA. Well, first of all, I like to say that, um, you know, we, we stand on, on our disabled ancestors. So we're, we're not the first. You know, our disabled ancestors kick butt from the blues to Ed Roberts. So yeah, we're standing on their shoulders. But you know, I think I, think I said what I want to see. I want to see, you know, LA be, you know, LA fully um, accessible, fully disability friendly, and fully led up to the disability rights movement, the disability justice movement, and our laws. And really, um, saying all the stories, because we, we learned from London that, you know, dis disabled protesters were outside of the Olympics. So we had to say their stories too. And what happened after that, when budget was cut, we, we, we need to learn from that so we don't make the same mistakes here in LA. And you want to follow up? Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that what we're thinking is um, to try and turn Rising Phoenix into one of the most interesting creative projects on the planet. Um, and as part of that, we, at the first film we made 16% of the people that worked on it. I'm now very ashamed of that number. 62% yep. um, of the people that made the podcast were disabled. but it was the best thing I've ever made in my life, but I also had no control over it. So that's probably why. Um, and the, this Tokyo is 25%. Uh, for Paris, um, we're just beginning pre-production. That's going to be a 50% production. And then I think we'll stick to 50 through the LA cycle. Um, when, in terms of the America piece, like we, I mean, I, I love Last Chance You, which is a Netflix sensation. It tells you more about people and into the lives of people. And we're thinking about how to build a very long story that can grow the audience for LA after Paris. But also we're thinking about... Um, the legacy opportunity for young people globally about learning about this. And, and uh, we've got a crazy idea that we want to get onto Broadway. Um, but I don't know how we're going to do that, but we'll try. And the point is that really nothing, uh, we actually had a meeting on the metaverse in this project and we haven't finished that yet. But the point is, I really would embrace all of you um, if you want to, to get in touch and contribute to what we're doing. And I'm very thankful to how open everyone has been to help us do today because it's a real privilege to do this at Real Abilities. And our, our, our mission really is to try and pull together the most um, formidable creative teams, um, disabled and non-disabled, to tell an extraordinary story that I think can move literally, quite literally, billions of minds. So um, I'm just very thankful. We're, we're all very thankful at Harder than you think that you've given us this opportunity tonight. So thank you. And I just wanted to say thank you to the panelists, and I really want to open up to the audience if you guys have any questions for any of us on stage. Actually, I have a question for you, Tatiana. If I'm not mistaken, um, you have been dubbed the fastest woman in the world. Is that correct? <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> when you were you know, a small kid, even before you started with your athletic things, did you ever envision something like that? Oh gosh. Um, when I started my career, I just turned 15 years old and I didn't know what to expect. I actually didn't know the Paralympics even existed. I told my parents, I was like, I want to go to the Olympics. Like I was obsessed at this point. Like I slept in my training tights to go wake up and train. I would come home from school and go training. And so I knew that like this was my destination and this was my path. And so when I made the team, I was actually the youngest in Paralympic history for, for track and field. And when I was on that podium um, with a silver and bronze medal around my neck for the 100 and 200, you know, I, I felt a type of way. Um, 
I didn't feel celebrated. I didn't feel important because when I looked out to the, the stands, it was just my family that was there. And they cheered for every single athlete from every country. And I thought to myself, what are we missing? Why, why is Paralympics not celebrated? You know, why, why is it so separate? Should I be ashamed as being a Paralympic athlete? And so when I came back home, after the games with a silver and bronze medal around my neck, I, you know, it, it wasn't even celebrated when I got back into the U.S. And I thought, well, what is the parallel here? What are we missing? And the, the thing that we're missing is that people actually don't really understand disability. And it's such a taboo when you say the word disability or it's a taboo when you say spina bifida or, or spinal cord or we don't talk about it, you know, don't ask them questions. And I thought to myself, well, I want to change this movement. And my, my idols were um, the Williams sisters in, in tennis. And they, they fought through a lot, through women in, in advocacy. And I thought, I got to win everything. And then people will listen to me and, and hopefully make that change. And so that's been kind of my journey. I'm in Beijing, I got three silvers and a bronze. And I thought, well, that wasn't enough. And then so I just kept adding on events. Um, in, in 2012 um, and 16, I got four golds and two, and two silvers. And, um, and I just want to, I have in, in uh, Paris, I want to get four or five medals more. And then in LA, I want to bring it home. You know, this might be my last games and I want to hopefully take everything home. And, uh, but it's just what I found in that moment through my success was, was my voice that I was being heard it became much more than just winning medals i was creating change for my own community alongside with other paralympic athletes and past paralympic athletes without the past paralympic athletes you know we wouldn't be at the paralympic village you know we wouldn't have the same rights we wouldn't have the same sponsorships and so i'm so grateful for all those athletes in the past and i think the athletes currently are still really fighting the strong fight. And I see athletes in the future um, looking at the athletes right now and saying, we want to be part of it and we want to be that, that social change. And so I hope that can answer a question of why I became the person that I am. Let's give it up for that. Come on. That is amazing. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? Hi. Um, First, I want to brag of my uh, memento from Tokyo. Oh, I was yay. also there <laughs> filming uh, a Paralympian that I've been following since 2018. So going through the whole thing and the disappointments and the excitement. And I wanted to ask uh, both Greg and Matt about collaborating with the very tough uh, Olympic uh, system. It wasn't easy for me, but I think you definitely had more access, but I want to hear more about it. Um, so look, I was the brand director of, amongst other things, of London 2012. So I do understand how rightly these assets are so valuable and they're protected because they help to pay for the games. And so um, I do get the system. I didn't get it when I arrived, actually. I was kind of a libertarian in those days and then I suddenly understood that it paid for the project so um, the one thing I'd say about the IOC and the IPC is deep down I've never seen them say no to a good idea I really will be, I really believe that I think that um, one of the I had this idea on 2012 which was to do with the torch relay for the Olympics and um, I think historically they'd been given mainly as corporate tickets to the torch bearers and my idea was to give them to what we in Britain call lollipop ladies. And they're the people that stop your children being run over by cars on the way to school. And I phoned the IAC and said, um, I want to give all the torchbearers to lollipop ladies. And the French reaction was, what is a lollipop lady? And um, But honestly, like it was a pretty silly idea, but they bought it. And so I'm less of a view now that actually they're, they are difficult set of rules but they're good rules because they help the partners achieve what they want so i've actually found them to be very very helpful when i've needed to be in terms of rising phoenix to be fair to the ipc we have complete creative freedom um i have final cut 
it's not, uh, if you like, an official, it's a partnership, but I deliberately built it so that we were free to be able to do what, what we wanted to do in a way that we wanted to do it. Um, so we're, we're, we're freer in that regard. Yeah, and maybe just to add to what Greg was saying, it, certainly these assets are protected um, for a number of reasons, um, largely due to the ability to underwrite or help support the delivery of the games. Um, I think today, and I can't even imagine what it's going to be six years from now, I think Greg talked about creativity and having creative freedom. I think it's never been easier to come up with new ideas and new programs that aren't the traditional protected um, type of ideas or type of assets. So that bringing a lens of creativity into now what is really any channel is a social channel, any channel is a story, a story to tell. So it gives on the commercial side an opportunity to really uh, become an out-of-the-box thinker and then build movements and rather than go and pitch ideas about um, what you would say are more traditional or transactional sponsorships of signage at games or multimedia representation, I think you can get really creative about how you build these stories today that you has been very difficult in the past. And to, I think, Greg, the other comment you made, I think the IPC and the IOC um, and the local delivery partners are much more open to that now, the idea of collaboration and co-creation. The ceremonies in France are actually a brilliant example of that because that, that would have been a computer says no, but actually look at what the Parisians are going to do with the ceremonies. It's really innovation. And, you know, the Olympics particularly, it's very established in our minds and therefore we have to innovate with it. So I, I do feel there's, I've never actually heard them say no to a, a good idea i think that they have to make sure that they do what they need to do to make sure the brands can help now build the movements i think that's sensible there's a flywheel effect too which would the general rights holder even if it's not a direct say victory for them if it's someone in the general ecosystem that they have built and they're getting investment and they're capturing investment into that ecosystem it creates a flywheel, becomes more partners involved in the broader movement. And I think that's a win-win-win for everyone. Any more questions? Oh, oh man, hey, I did, but I, it looked like she pointed in the back. Hi. My question to any or all of you is, what effect do you think the national media, international television coverage of the para half of the games has had for education, accessibility, enlightenment, because we're being seen. Channel 4 did a great job. Yeah, I, my, my answer to that is actually, I think historically, I think the broadcasting and the communication and the portrayal of the games actually was probably its biggest problem. Um, in London, we learned this really simple thing, um, which was crudely that sport presentation broadcasting was seen as being we're going to film a, a disabled sports event and what that meant was that the producers tended this is history um but the producers tended to go you know like and here's a person and they're disabled and they're going to try some sport and what it did is it created a terrifying reputation because sport is about winning and losing you saw it it's about incredible athletes and so i think historically i think that was a kind of ch a problem and then what we i think we created the paradigm shift i mean we actually fired the bbc and we hired channel four and probably the most extraordinarily brave thing i've ever heard i was at the time we were told no one's ever fired the bbc and we didn't really fire them we just didn't think they were going to create a legacy like we wanted to what we did is we changed the formula. We said, look, here's an event attended by human beings who want to be brilliant at sport. And by the way, maybe we talk about the disability, maybe we don't. And we, we tried to change the dynamic. I think that shift in the UK has had a profound effect on our, on our attitudes. And I, but I do sense globally there's still a huge amount of work to be done there. And I do sense here in America that that is going to be the, the trick 
to this becoming, if you like. By the way, at the end of the Paralympic Games in London, the national mood and our statistics around appreciation and empathy and love for the Games were higher on the Paralympics than the Olympics. So when it works, it's extraordinary. But I think that broadcasting piece historically was problematic. I'd like to think now that's what we're trying to do is to change the way this works. And if we get that globally, and that's become one of my life's missions now, um, then I think our attitudes do shift. And I think also, you know, we've had a huge increase um, with, with NBC, and that's been really quite an amazing um, partnership. Um, it's been really quite important. And just having them come out even to the marathons, which is we do yearly, it's been such an increase there. So I challenge NBC to have almost equal hours, hopefully by the time LA happens, because I feel like people want to see it. And as Matt mentioned earlier, it takes that first person to say, we're gonna take that risk and we're gonna see where it goes. And like I mentioned earlier, there's incredible amount of stories and people are so relatable to the general population that they would want to see it. And wheelchair racing is awesome in a pack and rugby where they run into each other is awesome. And I just, I think people want to see it. And again, it's, it's that challenge of, well, who will, who will want to, um, and yeah. And I just have to echo that with NBC. I think that they are headed in the right direction. No one has gotten it right yet. But I think even with the Tokyo Games, there were 1,100 hours of coverage for... And they added more towards the end. Yeah, exactly, because yeah. of the demand. Because once you start to increase visibility, you are also increasing demand. You're increasing interest in education. And I think that that's critical. We saw that with the most recent Winter Games as well. I already know that they are well and you know underway and planning for the Paris Games and increasing coverage there. And I think it takes more demand from folks talking on Twitter, talking on you know other communication vehicles to really show people that the demand is there and we need the increase in coverage across all channels, streaming and, and traditional television as well. And when you mentioned accessibility, um, NBC has an app, so a lot of people can follow it through through their phones or their computer, which it makes it a lot easier for athletes with, um, let's say like visual impairments to see what's happening. I think it comes back also to this myth about the audience. And it really is just a myth. It's a convenient old myth. So it's a myth no one really knows where they came from. But this, there is no audience. I mean, that was what I was told in 2017, 18, um, when, before we made Rising Phoenix. And it was like totally not true. And um, actually what I would go as far to say is, back to the NBC, I think they're so ambitious with their program and, and the way that they can see brilliant broadcasting and lots of um, amazing recognition for that is I think what we found with the podcast last year, I, I, no one would have said it would have been a top 1% download in the world. And it, it was because it was very good. And there's a lot of people out there that empathize with the content that's going to happen more and more. And the audiences will grow and grow. I would, I would like to see more sports classes that, that, that had disabilities, you know, um, you know, we talk about diversity and inclusion, and you know, we're cutting out of this so-called um, COVID. So, you know, we talk about change. I, I think we need to really do it. You know, I, I, I like the story about, you know, um, BBC didn't, didn't do it and you fired them. That's, that, that, that should be our reaction. If somebody's not doing what we want them to do in this inclusionary, you know, environment that, that we live in, then fire them and go to the next one. Because it's, I'm 54 years old. <laughs> I've been in the Paralympics in 1988. It's 2022. You know, so we're, we're not asking for you know, so much we're asking for what should have been there in the 90s, in the 80s, and now. So we, we just need to, you know, push them to do it. You know, everybody's talking about diversity and inclusion and, you know, 
companies are making positions, and we need to push those companies to do what they say that they're going to do. And that, that message should be about the Paralympic movement. It shouldn't be about the broader Olympic movement. I think it needs to be very specific. And in order to build a grassroots energy to support that, the identity needs to be shaped. Any more questions? Hi, uh, loved the film. Um, my name is David Radcliffe. I'm with the Writers Guild uh, Disabled Writers Committee. And I wanted to get your perspectives on something because there are very, very few openly disabled writers in the Writers Guild. We're 0.6% of the Guild overall. And one thing that we found in the last few years is there is a little bit more appetite for disabled storytelling. However, most of the time that comes across in documentary. And so it's hard for storytellers to make the jump from telling disability stories that are true life stories, documentary stories, to narrative storytelling, like as you would see for some other underrepresented communities. So I'm wondering to what degree any of you want to speak on how creative folks can collaborate and make the leap. I mean, for example, the fact that you are moving from 16% to 25% to hopefully 50% disabled creatives involved in the project is phenomenal. Um, and so I'm wondering how we can help inculcate that industry-wide across not just seeing true life stories of athletes, um, but also narrative stories of parents, teachers, loved ones, so on and so forth. Does anybody have thoughts on that? Uh, I'd, I, one of the things that we're thinking about is the kind of global talent pool that can, we can form by doing more and more of these projects. And um, so Jack Thorne, who you might know, incredible person, um, gave the most extraordinary lecture um, last year um, about this, he's one of the greatest writers, although I think he got fired from writing Star Wars, um, but he was happy about that. So, but he's an amazing um, writer, and he's one of the exec producers of this. Um, we're, we're beginning to talk through the idea of like a talent pool over the next six to eight years, and graduates of Rising Phoenix, you know, who then become part of what we do, but go on to do something else. I must admit, the one thing that I loved was Only Murders in the Building. Because what that had in it um, was something really remarkable where the character set, the core characters, six of them, let's say, um, I think one, one of them had a disability and then one from the outside of the core had one. There's two disabled stories in, if you like, a normal story. And two or three of the episodes ended up being almost solely about disability, but the program's not about disability, it's about real life. And that was their point. So I think that whoever, the writer's room of that, I think is something really remarkable that I think a lot of us should be aiming for. So I, I, my answer is, it's something I really want to work on. I'd love you to get in touch if you could. And um, it's something that I'd love to be building a kind of talent pool of people that help contribute to Phoenix, and, and, but then go and do their magic elsewhere in Disney and in all these magical places. And I also think, you know, um, we, we sports parallel so much back into our own communities. I feel like I've, I've kind of believed in this philosophy um, that if Paralympians and Paras can make it into, you know, this big thing like Paralympics equal to the Olympics and having the same, you know, the broadcast hours and, and pushing equality that we can put that into back into our own communities. And that's what I've been teaching my community whenever I go back, you know, I'm on the spina bifida boards and I go back to my para sports clubs and I, you know, I've also gone through, you know, uh, undergrad and grad school and I've done internships and I've been pushed away from internships and I fought for equal access in, in high school sports. And so I've always believed that parallel, if we can make it into the equality with sports, then we can give back also into our own communities so we are able to share more stories. But I feel like often that's, yeah, that the people can relate and see, you know, athletes and then back in term communities. 
I want, I want, I want, I want to give a um, shout out to um, U, UCLA um, because they they saw my work and I, I, I didn't apply. They saw quick hard work and they said, Leroy, you should come over here and do a PhD. And not only a PhD, but UCLA is starting this hip hop initiative and putting disability front and forward in that initiative, that's humongous. You know, as we know, sports and music go hand in hand. Sports and hip hop go hand in hand. You know, hip hop is gonna turn 50 years old next year. And for UCLA to put that on the front board burner with hip hop work and my work, that's huge. So that will change, you know, situations. But, you know, we, we need more um, people and agencies that they can take that first step. You know, my advisor, Aleem, took that first step and said, okay, anyway, let's really support what you're doing and really have an institution backing you. So that, that, that's the kind of leadership that we need from these organizations and these volunteers. Because we, we had done the work. People with disabilities had done the work. Athletes had done the work. So it's up to these volunteers to really put their mouth where their words are and really support it. And that's what UCLA has done. We have time for one more question. Yep. Hi there. I love the movie. Um, I've watched the Olympics since everyone since 1984, and I've been to eight Olympics. And I did. I was at the Paralympics in London. Um, I want to piggyback on the question about NBC. I think their coverage, honestly, it lacked for the Olympics and for the Paralympics. They just seem to focus on winning medals. They needed to focus more on stories uh, in the Paralympics. The Tokyo coverage was better, but maybe because of a time difference, they just, they could have done a lot better. Uh, they made it seem, stories took second to the gold medals and the, all the other medals. Um, NBC has the rights to the Olympics and Paralympics, I think, till 2032. And honestly, I don't think they've got it right for Olympics and Paralympics. What would you like to see NBC do for the next few Olympics coming up, which they have the rights to? Sorry. Oh. Oh, you go. I think that... Collectively, I think NBC learned a really um, good lesson about mental health in the Tokyo 2020 games and really felt like there was a shift um, sort of after that moment and that, you know, we, that athlete stories will be prioritized in the future and medals will be put second and I only say that because, you know, just having the conversation with NBC really recently, they are more interested in, in covering stories um, and athletes a lot more, um, especially for, for the Paralympics. And they are, you know, coming out and covering trials for us at the Paralympic trials that we had for Tokyo. And, you know, we hope to, to see much more. Um, but I think that that shift will, will happen. I think you're seeing it too, Ashley. Yeah, I don't want to speak on behalf of NBC, but I think 2021 for probably the entire world was a big time of experimentation and figuring out how to get through in a non-post-COVID world, still pretty much in the dead center of it. Um, I think with the time difference and the decentralization of content as well, NBC figuring out, okay, we're not just going to have our traditional channels. We're going to have USA Network and Peacock. And 
NBC Sports and all the different areas. I think that there was a lot of trial and error in figuring out what does work and what doesn't for future games. And I think even in the past year, as Tatiana mentioned, we've seen a lot more coverage of the in-between time between you know summer and winter games and summer again. And I think it's only going to keep getting better. I think that also goes back to co-creation, listening to the athletes, listening to their families, listening to fans about what works and what doesn't, going to fans where they are as opposed to trying to get them to come and watch something at a certain time because that's when it's happening live, just figuring out what works and what doesn't so that we can get to that right formula. But I think we are definitely on our way. Well, I think that's that's it. Thank you to the wonderful panelists. Thank you all for coming. It has been wonderful. And let's go LA 28.